Good news! I have managed to make it work. I did have to fix some bugs in the SD card code and wire up a few minor things, but up here you can see I have a console, a prompt, and I can actually do stuff, which is limited somewhat. I have a copy of ProText on this, but if I try to run it, uh, the system crashes to no one's great surprise. I should be able to read the README. There we go. So it's reading files off the SD card. I can create directories and files. Creating a directory takes quite a while for some reason. But uh, creating a file is pretty quick. Um, I, there may be something there to look into. Uh, does this work? No, it doesn't. Uh, as you can see, the environment is extremely DOS-like, extremely MS-DOS-like, because that's what they copied in the user interface. So at least it makes a nice, uh, simple environment to experiment with. Yeah, remember I can't do dir slash w. Uh, yeah, this was something I made earlier. There you go. So now we get to work on something a little bit more interesting, which is the screen. And because working on graphics code without being able to see what you're doing is kind of boring, I have, I hope, hooked up a webcam to actually film the machine itself. However, I have no preview because if I try to put a preview up on the screen, then the combination of the preview software displaying video and the capture software trying to capture video causes all kinds of bad things to happen. So uh, I've done a bit of basic testing, but we'll just have to hope it works and I will composite it on in editing, and I'm sure that won't take a horribly long time. Anyway, let's get on to graphics. The system on a chip does have an LCD controller, and I am sure this is being used for the graphics, uh, because I've looked at the code. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to set up. You just like program a bunch of registers with the size of the screen, the start of the frame buffer, and some information about the LCD device itself, which I don't have. So over here we've got Ghidra. I have fed it the LCD register names. So LSSA here is where the frame buffer goes, so we should be able to find places where it's written to. So for example, this undefined function so if I scroll down to get a name, hardware display in it, that seems plausible. So let's call this hardware display in it, turn it into a function. So what is it doing? Uh, it's looking at lots of parameters that we do not have set up correctly. I'm guessing those are all words. So let's just help this along a bit in the interests of clarity. So all these in stack things are misdetected parameters. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine. A. I reckon the first parameter is a pointer. Uh, that didn't do what I wanted. Right, let's turn. Go on, go away. Let's turn that off. Now we'll, it will auto assign things. Um, that's still not in the right place. I believe that the calling convention used by Ghidra doesn't match the one that Palmos is using. So can I? No, I can't put that somewhere else. Uh, 
let's bodge things slightly. Can I put that there? So I believe that param1, which is the long, is the address of the frame buffer because it's sticking that in A2 and then eventually it's writing it to LSSA. No, it's copying LSSA to it. That seems peculiar. Right, it's if the old parameter is zero, then it's copying the old value. I bet that down here, here we go. Well, I'm also slightly disturbed by all of these. I do not know what this is doing. Well, it's setting various bits and port K, but I don't know what port K is actually wired up to. And why is it trying to set the bits lots of times? Anyway, uh, I need to know what these parameters are, so I need to chase up the call stack, and I was, so I want to try and get them set if possible. So this is testing A2. A2 is here. It is, yes, A2. The first parameter is indeed a void star, but it's not at stack four, it's at stack six. That's better. So the neck, they should work up from there. So uh, I think this one's a word. And of course, it's not going to auto assign them for me. I'm guessing that uh, see, I need this to be at address four. It wants the first parameter to go at four, but we want it to be at six. But if I put a word parameter in, it tries to align it. Oh, I know what it's doing. It's pushing words as four byte parameters which we don't want it to do. Curses. Okay, we are going to have to set these explicitly, but I'm just going to add them first. So um, I think what we've got here is width, height, and frame buffer address. Was there a... I think it was just the three, actually. So this is the address. This is width. This is height. And that's at six A. No, there is a fourth one. Six A C and E. Stack O X C size two. Of course it's size two. Like I told it it was a word and E. Add stack OXE size two. 
Okay. So this is the address. This is the width. This is the height. And I do not know what this is, but it's probably the depth. Yes, it is the depth. You see here, uh, it's checking for a depth of zero that makes no sense. It's going from one bit, which is monochrome. Here, it's setting up the various registers for uh, two bit and four bit depth. So let's change that to depth. And that actually shows us what some of our values are, which is nice. And uh, LGPMR, if I remember correctly, is to do with grayscale. Here we go, gray palette mapping register, which we're not going to be using because we're monochrome. Okay, so where is our screen init code? Uh, we do not want to set up the frame buffer just yet, because that will happen here. And in fact, Dana screen base no longer has to be stored because we're just going to use the frame, bu frame buffer register. So here, uh, in Dana screen in what we actually want to do is to set up the uh, LCD parameters. So that will be uh, LPICF equals eight. And I'll figure out what these do in a moment. This is doing something with ports. This is on earth okay this is slightly complicated so we start with the top bit set and for every For every bit in D3, we mask off these these bits so that we just get bits 4, 5, and 6 into D0. And then we do practically nothing with it. We just set all these bits in PF and PK. Weird. Okay, well, I'm just going to put these up here somewhere. LPICF is this, LSSA we're going to set in a minute, LVPW, well let's just cut and paste all of this actually. Is here. Uh, this is the number of Oh, this is the this is the stride, the width of one scan line, in bytes. Uh, not in bytes. Uh, 
These are easy to set. And then it is calling some system traps that I actually forgot to look up. And I do wonder what these port K things are. Uh, is port K mapped to anything interesting? Uh, right, these look like the LCD control lines. Port K is multiplex with the Erda SPI and LCD controller signals. So at some point, something is going to want to uh, set the. Is because something is going to want to wire these up. Um, what's port K? Oh, that is port K. The other one's port F. What's port F? Uh, PF cell, there we go. Okay, contrast. Just contrast, as far as I can tell. So by ending this with BF, B is uh, 1011, so that is clearing bit 7, uh, bit 6. I would expect it to be trying to clear the contrast bit, to be honest. And then there's this whatever it's doing with port K. Uh, this is setting bit 6. And then it's repeatedly setting UDS. What's UDS? And then it's clearing UTS, and then it's clearing LD6. That is a mystery to me. However, it's clear that port K and port F have got something to do with the screen. So let's go and look for port K select. And where is it being written to? Well, pre-RAM init is where a lot of initialization happens. Uh, FD is setting all the bits except for bit 3, which is UDS. So, uh, which way round does port cell work? So only UDS is wired up by default. Again, that does not mean very much to me. So 
So the only other places it's being written to are in the SPI code, which is setting this bit. So data bit five is being connected to the just is being set up as a GPIO bit. So that one does not seem to be being used by the screen. None of this is making a whole lot of sense to me. Right, that bit is that bit is the power bit for uh, the second card. So that is setting the bit to be GPIO and clearing it. But it looks like PK cell is being written to in one place, which is there in the startup code. And that's setting them nearly all to be GPIO bits. The only one that is not a GPIO bit is uh, 1011 is data bit 2, LDS. So what is, I need to look at the LCD controller docs for this. The LCD data bus lines transfer pixel data to the LCD panel. The LCD controller is initially configured to drive single screen monochrome panels. The data bus size can be one, two, four, or eight bits by programming the LPICF register. So what is LPICF? LPOLCF. Right, LPICF, and in our code we are setting it to 8, so that's setting a bus width of 4 bits. This is actually being it's being read from a bunch of places, but it's being written to here. And right, okay. The bu the the physical connection to the uh, LCD is four bits wide. Then the bottom bits here indicate to tell it what grayscale mode to use. So we have to specify four bits because it's four bits, but we want to use black and white mode. So this should mean that we know which uh, bus pins we need to wire up. For four bits, we probably want, well, LD naught to three. So is there an LD naught somewhere? port C, which we haven't seen before. Are all of these LCD? But judging by the names, they probably are. So uh, 
our startup script has touched all this. Here we go. Port C select is zero, so they're all being set to dedicated function pins. That seems fair. But let's just set these anyway. Uh, that's pull down enable. Some registers appear to have pull up re uh, resistors, some of them have pull down resistors. This is a pull down resistor re uh, port. So. Right, these are the four bits used with, that we saw in that register. Here are the four data pins. So I think it's just those eight. But we do need to, I believe, set up the contrast line. Unless we just want to disable it. Oh, this is useful. Rather wish I'd found this earlier, to be honest. So yes, port C, LCD controller. Port F, LCD contrast. Port K, LCD controller. So... Port F select uh, and port K. Right, this is where the other LCD lines are. LDS and UDS, we still need to figure out what they are. Did I look up LDS? This, has got, this is all about RAM, nothing else. So I don't think we need to touch that. I still don't know what the code here is doing. But I think... Well, we still need to look up all these other things. LDPW. Virtual page width. Virtual width in pixels divided by 16 for black and white, 8 for 4 grayscale, and 4 for a 16 grayscale. Uh, LX max and LY max indicate the size of the screen. That's clear, clear enough. L pole CF polarity register. This is configured by the LCD panel, so we just use the magic number given. LACDRC rate control register. This is another magic number. Let's just leave it as is. LPXCD, pixel clock divider register, generates the pixel clock. Likewise, magic. LCK con, the, the clocking control register. I think we want the top bit to be set, to be honest. And why is that putting anything in there at all, given the lower bits are not used? Let's turn that on. And in fact, we should go look to see where LCKCon is being used. Pre-RAM init is the init code. Uh, it's used in two places in the display init. So this seems to be turning it 
off because it's clearing the register and here it's writing two to it that's this bit here yeah. so there's a function here that we haven't done anything with it's being written right this is clearly turning off the LCD Prove display depth. So unless this is trying to turn the screen off for some reason, then uh, that was A027 recomment 027 not a249 not a249 not Got all the traps, it's still not decompiling. Okay, I do not know why that's not working. This is proof display row bytes. Clearing lots of memory. I think this is this. Here we go. Ah, now this looks useful. Hardware display draw boot screen. Hardware display draw boot screen. Okay, so this is going to. It's filling the frame buffer with the. Uh, the boot splash screen. It doesn't appear to be touching much in the way of registers. So what it's doing is it's drawing the Palmos logo in the middle of the screen. Uh, however, it looks like Gidra hasn't spotted anyone calling this yet. So let's have a bit further down. Proof display backlight. Ah, ah. If we want the backlight to work, we will need to turn it on. And by the looks of it, it is wired up to port K. And this is also touching. L pole CF LP pole line pulse polarity. What that's doing is it's inverting the image by telling it that the data is either active high or active low. And I'm going to guess that PK here is the actual enable bit. Yeah, there's just one of them. So that is... Uh, let's help this along a little. 
Right now it decompiles and we can see there is there are two parameters, four and six. Which of course is putting in the wrong place. Oh, and apparently a, that's a temporary. So that is straightforward enough. What's this one? Prove luminosity to hardware register value. This is more lots of backlight stuff. Palettes, doze, timers, okay. So I think that's worth a try. And we do need to fill in a lot of stuff. That's a byte at A21. That's a byte at A23. A25. That's a byte at A27. That's a byte at A28. a byte at A2D. A33. A36, and that's a word. SSA is a long at a o o. Ah, going to the wrong virtual screen. LVPW is a byte. Max is a word at a o eight. Uh, L Y Max likewise a o a. Uh, there's also some cursor stuff that I don't think we're going to use. Uh, LPICF is a byte at A20. LRRA is a word at A28. Okay, so now we need PC cell. I'm 
There's a bite at 413. PCP Den. Which is a bite at 412. Somewhere on the internet there will be a header file with all this stuff in it. And it will be of a format that I can't quite use. PF cell is a byte at four two B. Okay. So this should build. So reset. Um, I can't see the flashing lights on my breakout board, but I don't think that's working. Let's just power cycle the Dana. And hope it's still on screen. Now I've moved it a bit. And let's see what happens when we run, when we run it. OK. Execute. Well, I don't see anything on the screen. which is a shame. So this is also being set here. Prov display base adder. Which seems to be uh, Conditionally setting the display address. Ah, oh, this one's interesting. Hardware display sleep. This is turning the backlight off. Turning the LCD controller off. And this is probably a bit to say that it's done it. So we have the LCD controller on. Let's uh, Let's just turn the backlight on. Also, I don't think I did that right. No, no, that's correct. The fields are two bits wide, so 08 is 104 bits. GS is zero zero black and white. Uh, there's the contrast. 
control. It's possible that it's running, but the contrast is all the way down. That was in LCK con. No, that was the that's just the enable bit. That register's got only got the LCD controller in it. Um PWM contrast. Right, so are we setting this? We are not setting this. Right, what is this setting that to? And apparently it's not being set anywhere. Did I get the address right? A36. Hmm. So it's not... It doesn't appear to be using the built-in contrast generator. So was that stuff to do with port F a uh, an external contrast generator. So let's look for screens. Yeah, we still don't know where this is called from. Display depth. Sleep. Oh, I didn't de decompile this one. Hardware display attributes. It's got this handy string in it. Backlight control. These all call private functions to get the work done. Get depth, nothing particularly interesting there. Hardware, LCD base address. Gamma correction table that just returns a pointer to a thing. Probably this. Uh, calculate nipper pulse width value. The nipper, the NIPR, is the non integer prescalar something. It's got to do with the UART, so we're now out of... Let's just decompile that. We're now no longer in the LCD code. Uh, so, display in it. PF and PK. PK data is B7, which is one one oh one oh one one one. PF data is BF, which is one one oh one 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 one. And then this is
no, sorry, that's D. Uh, this is B. So then the code here that is failing to decompile is actually repeatedly pulsing these mysterious bits. and then turning it off. So this is this is clocking something out to this bit This is the, sorry, I keep double clicking for emphasis and it doesn't do what I wanted. So this is working through every bit in a byte. This is the byte we're clocking out starting from the top. And So if the bit is set, then we set our bit here. We then jump to here and we pulse PK. Then we go again. If it's not set, we clear the bit in PF and we pulse PK. PK this bit in PK is a clock bit. This bit in PF is a data bit. It is clocking out a SPI style 8-bit value. And then here, in the next piece of code, We set a different bit enable wait disable and disable our data bit. Heaven knows what these are connected to. I wonder if I should at this point take the thing apart again and do some more trace following because I can find these bits in the on the CPU Or I could just try and copy the code and see what happens. Let's try that last, I think. Um, I want to go look for PF cell and PK cell. Wow, that's being touched in a lot of places. Prove BB get XY.
Is this the touch screen? Oh, it's next to the pen stuff. Um, I haven't looked into the pen stuff much. My feeling is that there's some external SPI hardware connected up to the second uh, SPI interface. And I think that could be the keyboard. So I wonder if this is the pen. Okay, I need to make I need to start making some more notes. So got port F and port K. So port F is we want this bit is our data port K we've got I think this bit's the clock uh, no it's not this one's the clock uh, and This seems to be some kind of finish or termination. And over here in the pen code, So FD, D is 1101. So it's 1101. So that this is pen related. So I don't think we need to touch that. It's being initialized here to C5. Which is 1100101. Uh, so that's 1100101. Port K is being initialized FD, 1111, uh, 1101. So these values actually match what we're seeing in the usage. This is the second SPI interface. These functions do not seem to have names, which is a shame. Yeah, this this is a this is a module containing lots of inline assembly. Uh, 
Let's see in here. So my thought is that I think this is pointing at a at the pen touch screen being connected possibly by SPI, maybe I squared C, one of these clock and data protocols. And when the uh screen is being initialized it does appear to be fiddling with one of the buses so possibly it's sending a reset code to the touch screen I do recall hearing about I squared C touch screens. But if that's the case, then we shouldn't need to actually do anything with this to make graphics work. The other thing, of course, is that the graphics are working, but nothing's appearing on the screen. So let us go into our config and turn off the serial console and we do need to enable a few things here pk cell and pk data PK data is a byte at 441. Oops. And PK cell is a byte at 443. Turning that, configura turning that configuration off broke a few things. So let's just do a little bit of warning fix. Thing. Push serial IO rec is actually defined here. Okay. So now we won't see a console here anymore. It should be going to the screen. Interesting, my reset button's not working anymore. Is this wired up correctly? Here, by the way, is a data sheet for a random I squared C touchscreen controller, which is uh, controlled by four wires. And here is a command byte. 
uh, and the top four bits do seem to contain the opcode. However, I have just spotted the address byte stuff here. The address byte is the first byte received following the start condition from the master device. Right, this is programming the 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 uh, the I squared C ID because you can have multiple devices on the same bus. Right, that makes sense. That means that this code here could be programming the I squared C address of the LCD controller to OX70. And then it's using either bit banging or the second SPI controller to actually talk to the touch screen. And I've also noticed there's a pile of code above that loop here, which could be sending a uh, a reset. So BF is 1011 again. Yeah, I think I am going to have to take the lid off this thing, find the touch screen uh, circuit board and look for integrated circuits. But in the meantime, let's run our thing. Well, I don't see anything in the screen. So that has still not worked. I'm a touch surprised that I haven't really seen anything that's writing a on bit. Hang on. Is that bit active high or active low? Have I just turned it off? Nope, I have to set it to a 1 to turn the LCD controller on. Okay, let's do some poking. What does this do? Hardware display sleep. So you see that is disabling the controller. That's actually, I think the same functions are in this ROM several times. So there should be a display wake, so display depth. Yikes. Let's just save quickly. Uh, yeah, Ghidra's not entirely stable. So, looking at the decompilation here, we are looking to see whether uh, the controller is enabled. If it is, turn it off. And PK data here is related. That's the top bit. Was that the backlight bit? Uh, no, it's not. 
this is the backlight. Also, I don't really see anything glowing. I don't think the backlights come on. We should check to make sure that code's being run, but I think it is. Okay, con. Proof display depth. Uh, that must be setting the depth. Yeah, there's, there are incoming parameters. Here, it is turning the screen on. And at the same time, it's setting this bit of PK. Is that power to the LCD module? So... We want to make sure that the the backlight hasn't come on because I've got this the wrong way around. We want to turn on. We want the uh, the backlight bit. Um, the backlight bit was in port K, not port F, wasn't it? I wrote that in the wrong place. Uh, yes, the backlight wasn't coming on because we set it to an internal function rather than to GPIO because once again, uh, I got the the sense wrong of PK cell. So yes, it was port K. So let's try this. That was interesting. You see, I ran the program, but then when I ran my script here, I didn't have to hit the reset button. That suggests that for some reason it jumped into the bootloader, which surprises me. Okay, and run. Backlight is on, I just saw it light up. But nothing seems to have shown up on the screen. So where is our... So this trap here, A249, 
it does seem to be making a point of doing that before uh, between enabling the LCD controller and setting whatever this is Let's see if I can get some of these parameters in place. Well, luckily, the first one appears to be at 4, and it's a byte. How many have we got? 4, 6... Second one looks like it's a word. Four and six. Probably a Boolean and. Don't know what the other one would be. But this is at location four. And this is at location six. Okay. Much simplified. Uh, the second parameter actually appears to be a pointer, by the looks of it. Yes, it is. And... If the if you don't specify something, it defaults to here, uh, but we don't know what here is. So this is clearly depth. And this variable, here it's calculating the old depth. Whatever param2 is pointing to is a structure containing the old depth, where the old depth is stored. Uh, if the LCD is on, turn it off. Recalculate the stride. Whatever that's doing, it's wrong. So this is the same setup we had before. Configuration for monochrome, 2-bit color, 4-bit color. Re-enable the, the LCD. So this is clearly changing the color depth of the screen. I am actually still wondering whether the whether anything is actually being displayed on the screen. We know this code got executed uh, didn't see a call to this. KDebug should still be going to the... Do we have KD... Yeah, we do have that enabled. KDebug should still be going to the serial console. Dana debug print. Um, so 
So that, yeah, that is writing directly to here. So I'm not sure it has actually called set fizz. But I also didn't see this message appear either. Okay, I do have to hit reset now and execute. Nothing is coming out. Why not? Let's just put this back the way it was. And then put some code in here. I'm just going to put so what that will do it will point the frame buffer at the bottom of memory which contains garbage so if the screen has been set up at all we should see something on it And actually, I will put, set that to there so we don't turn the backlight on un unnecessarily. Okay, so execute. Well, nothing is on the screen. But we do have a prompt. We can see that set fizz has been called, and here is the frame buffer address. While that was uploading, over here I looked up the UC Linux uh, code for the Palm Pilot. And this is not the Dana, but this is another Palm device. And here it is initializing the LCD. So this underscore start is code, apparently. So you can see here we turn off the LCD controller, we configure it, then we turn it on in multiple stages here. We do quite a lot of fiddling with PF. Here, after the configuration happens, it sets the it sets things up to display the splash screen. That is what penguin bits is. It's a bitmap containing a penguin. Uh, A05 is LVPW. Which is the stride in probably four byte blocks and then we have the width and the height and that is all there is to it well we can certainly copy some of this
Now PF data uh, eight five is yeah, I think this layout doesn't match the Danas. I am interested in that it is configuring a value for LCK con and we aren't. But of course we know that there's nothing in LCK con apart from the top bit. I think that this was recorded from running a ROM emulation. Which is why it's kind of undocumented. Um, I don't think there's anything more useful there. Well, what version is this? Nah, that's not useful. So the main thing that comes to mind to me is all that fiddling with port F. We have turned on whatever is on port K. Let's see where that is being. Oh, that's interesting. It's being touched a lot in the contrast code. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the same loop we were seeing before. Here is our, uh, here is our bit counter that starts at the top bit and goes down. And if we go down here, yeah, there's the LSR that shifts it right by one. So we and D4 with this to test a particular bit. Except now, instead of being a hard-coded value, it's whatever's in D4. That's, here is it, D5. Um, I don't like this compiler much. Here it was in D4. This is programming a contrast generator of some description. Right. We need to copy this. I think it's working. It's just that we're not seeing anything in the screen because the contrast generator, some pulse width, generator is not configured. So what parameters do we have? You've got six and eight. Six is a byte, eight is a long. Uh, so six is a byte, eight is a uh, pointer actually. So this is at 6, that one is at 8. Much better. And this decompilation is not working because I didn't tell it the registers were volatile. Uh, let's actually just go and do that. Remap. Volatile. And you see this generates this terrible long-winded decompilation. However, it does contain the code that's actually here. So that looks like param 
So this is loading the byte at param2. Interesting. Well, we know this is a byte star. Uh, it may even be a char star. Uh, that hasn't helped. Right, I thought that this was a signed value. I can't tell it it's signed. Okay, so that's a byte star. So, this is clocking out some kind of initialization sequence. Then we get here where we clock out the actual contrast value. Which is calculated in S var. Don't know where it got this plus seven zero from. And then there's more clockings. I think we need to clone this code. First, let's have a quick look to see where it's called from. Only one place, which is here. Uh, what we do is we push 10. We then push the byte 8, and then we push that's taking three parameters. This is using two parameters. It's also interesting to note that we know that, the, that one of the parameters is a pointer. Oh right, no, this, this is pushing a uh, it's not pushing the value 10, it's pushing a value off the stack. So this is our pointer. Um, in fact, this is a function. So Uh, the byte that's being passed in is always zero. That's param1. So if param1 is not zero, do this. Parameters are pushed from right to left, so in fact there are two byte values. They are two aligned, because that's what this does. So is yeah, there must be another byte. Whoops. There must be another byte at 
uh, stack four. Here. So param one is never touched. Param two is t taken from the stack, taken from the caller of this. There we go, you can see these showing up. So who calls this? Well, the startup code. Oh. So the asterisk means it's not being called, it's being ref uh, a pointer to it's been taken. So what this is doing is it's setting, uh, it's setting up the system call table which means that actually this will be called from a trap somewhere and I've got no hope of finding it without more knowledge. So I don't know what values are actually passed into this. So we'll just have to try it and see. So I would guess that I would guess that the parameters to this, I think that this is, this is a simple flag to say actually update the contrast. And this is a pointer I try to keep doing the wrong thing there. And this is a pointer to where the contrast is. So if the flag is set, then we update the contrast based on the value that got passed in. So this can be... Oh, uh, it's been used in lots of places. Uh, that's just a temporary... I'm surprised to see this because I would expect this to be returning what the contrast is currently set to, but it's not. My suspicion is that by returning OX80, it's because whoever did the port to this system uh, didn't have a way to return what the old contrast was. Although why they don't just store it somewhere, I don't know. So I think we've got enough information to actually uh, do this. I am a little puzzled by this value. Uh, so divided by three plus OX seventy. Minus OX seventy. This is doing some sort of calculation to determine what value to send to whatever this chip is that we're talking to. Uh, the other thing I'm a bit concerned about is why it's doing this strange repeated setting of the value. It could just be a cheap and nasty way of doing a timing loop, to be honest. But there must be other better ways to do that. Well, I'm going to go and look up the 68,000 instruction set to see how long each of these things takes so that we can do our own timing. 
So or I with a byte is 12 clock periods, but I don't know what a clock period is. It may not be the same as a clock cycle. So I think in the interest of simplicity, I am just going to copy this code. So that's going to go into our machine code section. All right. to set up a stack frame to get at the parameter. Nope, we can do this. Can we do it all in the registers that get uh, saved by default, whatever they are. We can see that it's D0 and A0. This looks like you get D0 and D1 and A0 and A1. Which mm, it's not using A0 or A1 anywhere, so maybe you don't get those. So the A0, A1, okay. So the first thing we do is send out the, the initialization bit. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, suddenly unable to type. So let's just convert these into binary. B is 1011. This is 
F7 is 1111, BF is 1011111. Is that all PKs? Yes, it is. So um, if this is clearing these two bits, I would kind of expect... Oh, right, these are the bits we're about to set in the next chunk of code. So what we are doing is... We want to and these two together to test whether uh, the bit is being set. If it is zero, we clear the bits from port F. If it is one, we set the bit in port F. So I'm just trying to think if there's a slightly cleaner way to do it than this. And this will do. So BQB bit is zero. At this point the bit is set, so we want to do 0100. So that takes us to here where we one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are four zeros, these are O eights. At which point we BF is one oh one 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 Okay, so uh LSRB one Z zero no D one this one um, if it is not zero we still have bits to go so go back to the loop otherwise we ping this bit again 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. Whoops. Uh, we've done F seven B F. Yes, that was this. And we are done. So this is setting this bit of port K. Let's just double check that's right because it doesn't look it. Four zero PK data one two four yes this is PF and this is B B is one oh one one ha one oh one one PK data So what this is doing is it's setting a it's setting a bit that tells whatever's attached to this that coming up is a command. We wait, then we unset it, but we do we also unset this bit. Ah, right, this is clock. Okay. So we set the uh, command is command is coming up. Clock, wait. Unclock, clear the command bit. Then we set the data bit. This is a different clock bit. Yeah, possibly this is the clock bit and this is the command bit, but this does seem to be what's going on. Okay, Dana set LCD contrast. Oh, does this really not support binary? Uh, sh I'm sure I saw binary in one of these uh, assembler files. Here we go. OB, that's what it is. Yeah, uh, percent is used to introduce a register. So, change that to that. And that's not right. That was our BF.
actually, you know what? I am going to do it like this. So that should make it clear what bits are being set and what aren't. And I do need to check up on what chip we're actually talking to here and see if I can find the data sheet. Uh, should we at some point be setting this bit in this termination clause like we're doing here? because we set it here and we reset it here. So PK data F7 BF. Apparently we're not. Okay, what does this do? Symbol loop is already defined. Um, can I do that? You're right. Okay, that does work. Uh, what this does is it says branch to the closest one going backwards, which is here, and two going forwards, which is here. So we could replace this as well if we wanted to. Okay, so... What kind of values are we getting here? Well, if this var is zero, that becomes minus OX80 divided by five minus seven zero. OX80 divided by 5 minus OX70 is minus 137. And likewise, if we went in the other direction, Let's just pick C0 for some reason. Where are we? Here. So... C0... Uh, minus OX80 divided by 3 minus OX70 
minus 90. So let's pick minus 100 and see what happens. Is it declaration of Dana set LCD contrast? Okay, and we need to define this. And we haven't defined uh, PF data yet. So where did I put that data sheet? Here it is. Port F data 429. So let us execute. Oh, and it crashes. At 856C. We're using D0 and D1. is doing. Uh, set LCD contrast, we are pushing one five six onto the stack. So this is pulling the value from four. So a uh, big endian value starting at offset four. So this is picking the least significant byte. Then we call the subroutine, which is this. So the program counter is 856C. Eight five six Ah I forgot to tell it these all needed to be byte sized values. So it's doing a four byte load and store with hilarious consequences. Well, it's doing word size, apparently. Now it's doing byte sized. And what happens when we run it? Woohoo! I don't know if you can see it but I can see garbage on the screen. It's very faint. So I have to look almost side on to see that, but it's definitely there. We have a working screen. Right, we now just need to figure out what uh, a sensible contrast value is, but that is easy. All we need to do is
what we do is this, so that will then cycle through all the different types of contrast, and when we see something on the screen that looks roughly right, we simply hit Control-C and look at the last value printed. appearing. It does look like we want a fairly high number, but it's not as contrasty as I would have hoped. Maybe I'm just looking at things from the wrong angle. Uh, yes, from where I'm sitting I can barely see it, but it does look like all contrast values are in fact negative. So if so, I'm a little bit surprised that this didn't seem to do anything. Possibly again, I just couldn't see it. I'm going to give that a try. See what this does. I can't honestly tell if it's changing. Yeah, I I genuinely cannot tell if anything's happening. I suspect it's not. Now, I, we did find that initialization code that was setting OX70. So let's just try that. And I will also remove that line. So now we should be seeing the Immutos frame buffer, whatever's going to be in it. Okay, let's see what this does. Uh, I think I can see a C prompt in the top left corner. Uh, nope, it was a smudge on the screen. <laughs> okay, so let's try it without the serial console. Okay, so we run it. Um, no, no, I... Th Uh, yes, of course, this OX70 value is below OX80, so it's not going to do anything. Let me just try and find that code again. Uh, Uh, it was display in it, wasn't it? Display. Hardware display in it? Yeah. All right, PK data. Here's our code. And it is indeed writing OX70 to the whatever it is. I wonder if 7.0 is a reset command 
and anything with the top bit set is a set contrast command. Now let's try that. I am going to have to take the lid off this thing and find a data sheet for the chips on the LCD panel. I did notice when I was disassembling it earlier that there's actually, it's quite a big PCB in there. Okay, what does this do? I see stripes. So in a desperate attempt to try and make that visible, I turned the uh, backlight on, but I don't think it's helped much. However, you can, you might just be able to make out, I wonder if I turn these lights off, that will help. Uh, there is some mangled text across the top of the screen. And I figured out why, which is that the, the fiddling I've been doing with the screen size is inconsistent. So this wants to be 560. Actually, let's put these in here. So here we all want to change this to Dana screen width and Dana screen height. Now I think there's some more stuff wrong as well. So let's just have a quick look through here for more Dana e things. No, that seems to be it. because it's only actually initializing a small chunk of the screen. Is that actually better like that? I think it is just. Now, uh, other things that could be wrong is, does this register, does the LSA, LSSA register, where is it? That's a bad hyperlink. Let's try this one. Nope. Here we go. Does this register have to be aligned anywhere? Now it does say that it must be stored in a one megabyte boundary. But I think other than that, it doesn't care. I mean, it needs to be word aligned. Uh, have I programmed any of these registers incorrectly? This, I think, right, we have a 16 color display, but a monochrome frame buffer. So I think this needs to be a different calculation. So instead of divided by four, I think this needs to be divided by 16. And we want to round up. Actually, let's just do it like that. So I think this might do something more appropriate. Uh, 
Okay, so we run it, and I don't see anything. Nope, if I look more carefully, I can in fact see a EmuCon prompt at the top of the screen. The contrast is terrible, but it is actually working. Okay, good, we are getting somewhere. So right now, let's go into the config and um all oh, right we're not getting a splash screen because it's not the first boot so it goes straight into emucon okay well what we're going to do now is to turn on the whole vdi sorry we've got the vdi is to turn on the aes the entire gui and let's just make sure that builds and this is giving us a much bigger image it's now 200k so let's upload this and this is going to take a while yeah, this download is over twice as long as the previous one. I know what I'm going to be doing next. Uh, this is actually not the slowest download I've had to work with. I once had to work on a dev board with a 300 byte per second upload speed and a 1 in 3 chance of a transfer failing after multiple megabytes. Okay, and let's run it and see what happens. And there is indeed a gem desktop. I do not know how much of this is coming up on the camera, but uh, down here there's the printer icon. Up here is drive C. Here is the trash can. And there's a menu bar along the top of the screen. That is fantastic. I am very pleased that works. That could have been so much harder, I have to say. So what I'm going to do now is call it for the day. I'll just do a little bit of tidying and some check-ins. Um, I'm actually getting rather behind on my editing. Let's get rid of some of the extraneous tracing. The next thing I'm going to be doing is to introduce a compression layer to in the transfer. I should be able to reduce the size of the image to transfer by about by about a third to half, depending, because any further development is probably going to need. Uh, well, for the pen, I'm going to need the full image. For the keyboard, I can use the console. I also really do need to take the thing apart and check for chips. But uh, it is now nearly all working. There's only two more things, two more major things we need to do, which is the mouse and the keyboard. The mouse, of course, is the pen-based touchscreen. The keyboard is the keyboard. I think they are... Uh, I think they're both connected via SPI2, so that will be a bit, bit exciting to investigate. And again, I need to know what chips are attached to the other end. So, that's awesome. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.